You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 258. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well-being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hey, veggie lover, welcome to another episode in the fasting series. Now this series is intended to provide education about the potential health and longevity benefits of different forms of fasting, including time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting, and extended water-only fasting. Please be aware that in this series, we will be discussing different forms of fasting and food restriction. And in some cases, there will be references to body size and weight. This material and these methods are not appropriate for children, pregnant people, or people with certain medical conditions. Please do not attempt these practices without medical supervision as it could be very dangerous. These concepts may also be triggering for people with disordered eating or eating disorders, so please practice discretion before listening to these episodes. Thank you and I hope that you enjoy this episode. Steve Hendricks is a freelance reporter from Boulder, Colorado. He is the author, most recently, of The Oldest Cure in the World, Adventures in the Art and Science of Fasting. The Wall Street Journal called the book, quote, an illuminating exploration in the rich and varied history, a myriad health effects of fasting, end quote. And Publishers Weekly called it, quote, a winning mix of captivating storytelling and fascinating science, end quote. In this episode in the fasting series, my key takeaway are that fasting has been practiced for centuries for a variety of reasons. Fasting has physical and spiritual effects on humans, some of them quite profound. Fasting can be taken to harmful extremes and that fasting in the medical community is being more commonly accepted, but we have a long way to go. I hope that you enjoy this episode in the fasting series with Steve Hendricks. Steve Hendricks, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm super excited to talk to you about the history of fasting and all of the things that you've discovered. But before we get to that, I'd love to learn more about your plant-based journey because that's another thing that you discuss in the book. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I actually uh, first went vegan in high school and uh, was that through college. This was not something I talk about in the book, but growing up in central Texas in uh, the 1980s, it was not a common thing. And even, uh, you know, in the early 1990s, when I was living in Seattle, um, being vegan was not especially common then either. It was much harder to do. And so uh, I, I became a lapsed vegan pretty soon after, uh, you know, in my early 20s and spent most of my 20s, 30s and 40s being an omnivore. Now, I'm married to a vegetarian. We have a vegetarian son, so I mostly was vegetarian. But it really wasn't until my 40s that I started re-examining some of the things I had examined when I was you know, first at, at, for doing it at 16. And it was questioning the, you know, the stories we tell ourselves, frankly, the lies we often tell ourselves about, oh, the animals have a good lives and, and, and they don't know, you know, what's coming and don't fear the, you know, the death and you know, all these sorts of things you tell yourself to make yourself feel better. And it, it just suddenly occurred to me, or I don't know about suddenly, but over a period of a year or so, it occurred to me, well, I, I love my dogs. What's the difference between the dog I love and the, and the cow on my plate or the pig that's probably smarter and equally capable of love as my dog? So um, over a period of years for ethical reasons, because of uh, concern about animal welfare and because of concern about uh, the climate catastrophe, 
uh, in my 40s, I'm 52 now, I became uh, a vegan. First, I got rid of mammals, then I got rid of birds, then I got rid of fish, and eventually dairy and eggs and so on. Um, but becoming vegan isn't the same thing as becoming a healthy vegan. Um, I wasn't an Oreo and Coca-Cola vegan, but, you know, I was a oily hummus and processed white flour and salt and sugar crackers vegan. Um, and my health really um, didn't improve radically from this shift to veganism. Um, and it really took a, a severe crisis of my health in my late 40s before I began to take a very hard look uh, at uh, what I was eating uh, and eventually, about four years ago, became uh, what I would call a minimally processed vegan, um, one without any added, um, you know, salt, oil, sugar, not white flour, um, not, you know, highly refined and processed foods. So that was the final stage of my my path to where I am now. Wow. So fascinating. Okay. Tell me where in central Texas you grew up. I grew up in a town called Temple, which is uh, on Interstate 35 between Waco and Austin and um, a little too close to Waco for my comfort, not close <laughs> enough to Austin. I love it. I grew up in Huntsville, Texas. So oh, that's well, funny. That's why we yeah. have lots of intersections because now I'm in Washington State and you are in Seattle too. So very cool. Yeah. Uh, Texas is definitely, I mean, besides Austin, it would not be what you would defined as a vegan friendly state. So <laughs> no, it, it was not. I, I did not get a lot of support from either family, friends, you know, veterinarians, doctors, you know, you name it. No, no one was in favor of my veganism. Yeah. And it's funny that you bring up veterinarians because whenever you were talking about this discovery of speciesism that you, you, you know, you were finding in your own life, like why my pet, but you know, not this. I remember going to the vet recently and it was a new vet that had just joined the practice where my, where I take my dog and they had this flyer for her announcing that, you know, new vet to the practice. And there was a picture of her with her dog, you know, picture with her hiking. And then in the big corner, there was a picture of her with the dead fish she had just caught. Right. And it's like, <laughs> not to nobody else would that even trigger anything. Like that's, that's all normal, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> It's, but once you have crossed that threshold and you see the world differently, then you realize, wow, that's, that's fascinating that you're going to have this dead fish and then you're going to love these pets and do all these life-saving things to help these pets survive. So, so yeah, that's a very interesting journey. So thank you for sharing that. And also the other thing that I want to point out is I remember being in my thirties and my friends and I would talk about how people in their 40s were always complaining about how things start breaking down in their 40s. And we're like, we're not going to be like that. It's all about mindset. We're going to have the mindset that nothing's going to happen, you know, in our 40s. And that's, I think, totally not true. Things really do change in your 40s. <laughs> and I've discovered too, which is why I have this whole fasting series, that things started happening. And I think you can get away with a lot in those first few decades, right? You can eat all the processed foods and not sleep and not manage your stress that well. And you you can get by, but then once you hit your 40s, I think your body's like, yeah, we should probably think about this a little bit more and, and put more attention and effort into this. So yeah, I think it does make a difference after after some time. So you are now a minimally processed, whole foods, plant-based eater. Tell me about fasting, because that's another layer to health and well-being. How did you become interested in fasting? And then when and how did you decide to write a book about it? Yeah, so I first became interested in fasting, oh, maybe almost 20 years ago now. And I did it for um, uh, two reasons. One was a reason a lot of people turned to fasting, which was for weight loss. I had, um, you know, like a lot of people just put on a pound or two, you know, each year. And then in my 30s said, wait a minute, <laughs> this isn't the, the body that I remembered having. Now, I since have come to a more nuanced view about the use of fasting for weight loss. And I have a lot of reservations about it, so we can get into that. But that's that was originally why I came to it for, for half the reason. And the other half was I became intrigued by these fascinating longevity studies, which showed that in, for instance, in uh, lab rats, 
uh, with certain types of fasting, you can almost double their lifespan. And they end up being far less diseased, far healthier. And what these studies were showing was that fasting unlocked these really impressive repair mechanisms. And it seemed to be doing that in humans as well. Um, at, at that time, we didn't have as much research, but it was all very intriguing. So, so for those two reasons, that's why I became interested. I first started writing about fasting about a decade ago. Um, and what has happened, uh, and that was in, you know, magazine articles and online, what has happened in the decades since that encouraged me to write a book was the science of fasting has just blossomed in the most beautiful way over the last decade. And we now know vastly more about it than, than we did when I first started writing. I also, over this time, became interested in the, um, the long and fascinating history of fasti fasting, which um, I realized was also a story that hadn't been told or to be blunt when it had been told had been told wrong or had been told badly. <laughs> um, and then the third strand was um, that my own experiences with fasting had grown. Uh, and I have no doubt whatsoever. I'm very confident in saying that I feel that fasting um, played a huge role in giving me back my health uh, in my late 40s. Um, and I thought that that was a, a story worth telling as well. So my book, The Oldest Cure in the World, weaves together these three themes. It's a history of fasting, science of fasting, my own experiences of fasting, and I hope they come together in an engaging narrative. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. I think you did a good job of meeting those goals for sure, because it does read in some parts just like a story, you know, and it doesn't get that heavy sciencey feel that can be difficult for some people to get through. Well, let's talk about the history of fasting, because I think it has become a buzz term. And now you're seeing in the media more studies yes, it's good. No, it's bad. You should fast. You shouldn't fast, you know, these kinds of things, but this is not a new thing. So tell us about how long has fasting been practiced by humans? Well, we, we have fasted our entire history and uh, all of our ancestors have fasted going back at least a billion years. And, and we know this because those repair mechanisms that I mentioned that are unlocked by fasting we share many of those with yeast, with whom we last had an ancestor a billion years ago. So, and these fasting mechanisms have been conserved and they have been augmented throughout uh, the, the billion years of evolution since then. So, um, you know, early hominids millions of years ago fasted when Homo sapiens emerged 300,000 years ago, they fasted as well. In recorded history, so the earliest writings start appearing about 5,000 years ago. Um, and we see references to fasting appearing almost as soon as writing appears. So we know that it was going on. Now, the fasting back then was almost exclusively for r religious purposes, for the spirit, not for the health, for the body. Not that ancient peoples would have conceived of it that way. They didn't have this dichotomy between uh, spirit and body that uh, many modern people like to, to hold to. Um, and, you, and you can see how it would happen. When you fast, you undergo these, when you do a prolonged fast, you undergo these physiological changes. Your blood pressure drops, your heart rate slows, you uh, have brain functioning patterns that, that are going on that's all conducive to a meditative state. And then if you were to fast for long enough or uh, severely enough, for instance, without any water, you could even hallucinate. So for an ancient mind that saw portents in the crows and was conversing with gods daily in dreams, you could see fasting as a portal to, to the divine. So it's very um, understandable how fasting uh, sort of grew into virtually every culture, virtually every single uh, religion on earth. Um, almost any religion you go to, there's some element of fasting in it. But it was hugely variable. In some religions, you know, it was just fasting was just this little adjunct that might be used sometimes to help get into a meditative state. Other religions like Hinduism and Christianity just went whole hog into fasting. Um, and, um, you know, we, 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 we can talk about that for good and bad. Um, there were a lot of things that came out of that deep investment in fasting that, um, that, what, that, that weren't healthy. Yeah. 
it's so counterintuitive because nowadays we eat an average of seven times a day and even <laughs> skipping one meal feels like impossible and like a big torture. So I think a lot of people that have never experienced the effects of fasting, even if it's just for more hours than usual, they're thinking it's just painful, it's it's difficult. Why would that, you know, even be a benefit? But you're right. Once you get used to practicing fasting, you do know that you can get to a place where it actually feels good and you could even potentially get to a place where you're experiencing euphoria. So I can imagine whenever you're not knowledgeable about the science of fasting and what's happening, what an amazing gateway people had to like have that sensation and think, oh yeah, this is, this is God, this is the spirit, this is whatever coming into my body, giving me the state of euphoria because I'm paying whatever penance or doing whatever sacrifice, you know, humans are good at explaining things like that, you know? So, so it makes sense to me how, you know, maybe it accidentally happened and you're like, oh, this must be God. And this is the way we do it. And this is the way we get closer to God. So that makes a lot of sense. Well, let's, let's get into, because you alluded to it, the dark side um, within the history of fasting where has it gone wrong or extreme? And we can talk about the religious fasting, but then in your book, you also touch upon, you know, these times in history where fasting has just gotten really popular and people have just really gotten into it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, we'll start with the religious and, um, you're, you're right that, um, people thought that fasting was a way of becoming more holy of becoming closer to God. So you can see how just in that statement, those the, the seeds of abuse have already been sown. Because if a little bit of fasting makes you holy, well, then a lot of fasting ought to make you even holier, right? And a ton of fasting ought to you know, bring you almost to the state of the angels. And they almost literally thought this. There was this belief in early Christianity in something called the bios angelicos, the life of the angels. Uh, and one reason people fasted themselves, these desert fathers and mothers in particular sometimes, these monks who would go out into the wilds of Syria or um, Egypt or Palestine and fast themselves to these uh, great extremes in some cases, um, you know, they held, held this idea that in, in, in heaven, in the afterlife, one would achieve this life of the angels. You would be angel-like. And in that state, you would you would weigh almost nothing. Your body would practically not exist. And so to the extent that we could approximate that state of the angels here on earth, we were approximating the holiest of the holies that we could ever hope to attain for in, in this lifetime. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, um, you know, what I would call almost idiosyncratic abuse, which is to say some, you know, monk who would take it way off the deep end. Um, but they weren't, you know, everyone. Um, they were a few people, um, but they were pointed to as exemplars. Where the real problem I felt uh, lay when I was looking into the history of fasting and writing about it was the burden that, that fell upon women in fasting. And what's interesting was this, this was worst in Christianity, but it was by no means limited to Christianity. So in Hinduism, for example, it so happened that the men who wrote the rules of the religion just happened to think, can you imagine, that the, the, the people who needed fasting the most weren't men, but women. And so the burden fell on women to do the vast majority of the fasting. Something similar happened in Christianity. And the reasons for it was that man was supposed to be this, uh, this upright creature who was who was only led astray because he was tempted by this seductress woman. And the way that, <laughs> right, right, exactly. So the way that they were going to deal with this, these early church fathers, was they, they made a fetish of um, female chastity. And fasting was going to be used to safeguard that chastity, that virginity. Um, it was believed that fasting could dry up these moist humors inside us that gave rise to lust, and in this case, particularly female lust. It could also make women less beautiful and less attractive. If you took fasting to a great extreme, it would actually obliterate womanhood by pairing hips and breasts and buttocks and ending menstruation even. Now, what's really curious and, and, and sad about this is women and girls were not, so this was not supposed to be punishment. They were supposed to welcome this, you see, and, and their reward was that they would be brides of Christ. 
And this term was meant literally. And some of the creepiest uh, writings of antiquity in the early Middle Ages are these uh, erotic writings uh, by church fathers working themselves up into a lather, imagining uh, Christ's sexual union with his, his many brides. What this led to was a couple of things. It led to a rise over the Middle Ages, um, that period from roughly 500 to 1500 AD, uh, of these uh, fasting saints, these, these women who were deeply anorexic, some of whom actually starved themselves to death. And they were, of course, the outliers. But what's important here is that even though all girls and women in Christendom and in, um, the, the, in Europe and the Near East, even though they didn't all fast this way, for a thousand years, they were led to believe to one degree or another that they were failures, that they were sinners, that they had let down God if they didn't go to some degree down this path. And the amount of suffering is just, it's mind boggling and horrifying to contemplate the suffering that was visited on girls and women. And I thought this was an, very important to talk about um, because although I can't draw a straight line from there to how we, how we in our society make girls and women feel about their bodies today, um, to be aware of this history and that we have at least once been down this road um, where we tell women that they need to be thinner for whatever reason, it's more secular now, it was more religious back then, and that we abuse them and destroy their you know, psyche um, by telling them that if you don't live up to this ideal, you're a failure. I thought that was very important uh, history for us to be mindful of today, uh, given how, you know, uh, body imaging and that this includes fasting has often been used to browbeat women uh, in our century as well. Yeah, for sure. No, I, to me, it makes complete sense that we still have remnants of that, of that powerful history, because it just makes a lot of sense that that's how we feel about it. Like, especially to me, I'm very fascinated by just body size in general and the science behind body size and how multifactorial it is and dependent on so many different things. But in our society, the assumption is you're larger body just because you eat too much and you should do everything in your power to just eat less, whether that's painful or difficult or whatever. And the harder you work at eating less and not eating, the better you are. It like elevates your status, you know? So it's almost like that sacrifice, that grit of not eating makes you a better person. So even though we're not seeing it as religious now, I think that there is a connection there, especially for women, you know? But that's it, so it, sad. It, it, it's so sad. It is, an, it is invested with a moral quality, isn't yeah. it? And I think yeah. you're right. I hadn't really thought of it in that term, but I think that's brilliant of you to make that connection that it has, they both have a moral air to it. So I think you're right on the money there. And there was this whole um, time in history too, or at different periods of time, you were talking about people fasting almost in a competitive way and like these fasting girls. And it was, it was almost like this um, entertainment, like people would go and, and watch people fast and, and like fasting tourism and go see all these fasting. So how do you think that evolved? Yeah, so th this goes all the way back to antiquity as well, the, the competitiveness of it. The, some of these desert fathers would, you know, they'd learn that some, you know, other monk further up the Nile was doing some more extreme form of fasting, and they would adopt an even more extreme form to try to, you know, be holier. Um, and these would eventually gain more... Um, you know, I don't know what you would call it, a wider audience because the more extreme fasters were the ones who, um, who became more, uh, more, more widely known. And this sort of interest, this almost purient interest in people who take fasting to extremes, right? It just continued all the way through the middle ages and the Renaissance where you had, once the fasting, once the fasting saints, those religious women who were fasting to be holier, once they sort of died out with the rise of the Age of Reason and the Renaissance around 1600, 1500, 1700, somewhere around there, they were replaced by women who also fasted in a very similar way, but for very secular reasons. And they fasted for fame. They fasted because they wanted to be admired and to be renowned. And you're right. People would travel from all over. Dukes and princes would travel. They would be invited to the courts of kings and queens. 
And for some, you know, like stable girl who had no prospects whatsoever in life, you know, other than, you know, maybe to marry the slightly more prop prosperous tenant farmer down the road or something, this was an enormous opportunity at uh, a, a better life, <laughs> certainly um, a, a more um, prominent and more, more fame-filled life, uh, but, but possibly also a more prosperous life. life. And so for those reasons, I think, um, you know, this sort of fasting for attention grew, and it continued all the way through the 19th century and even into the early 20th century with these very famous fasting artists who would fast like in cages in uh, a cafe in Berlin, say, for 60 days where people would, would come and drink their coffee and watch this guy, you know, starting for two months. So yeah, it's, we, we just are fascinated by these things, apparently. It's, it's so interesting that that even happened. I feel like now it's people, especially with social media and stuff, it's like nobody believes anything anyway. So I'd be like, oh, whatever. <laughs> but um so let's talk about the more scientific and medical part of this. When did the medical community start to become interested in fasting and how has it evolved over time? Yeah, so it goes back to at least uh, Hippocrates, so um, four or 500 years before Christ in, in ancient Greece. Um, but the ancient doctors knew absolutely nothing about fasting. They knew almost nothing whatsoever about medicine because there was a taboo on uh, dissecting the body, on performing autopsies. Um, so if you couldn't look inside the body and see how things work, you had to come up with all these cockamamie theories. Um, and um, they were all wrong. They were all just terrible. Um, so every once in a while throughout the centuries, some doctor would stumble on something for fasting that worked. The most common of that, which came about in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, were some methods that various doctors used to fast people when they got an acute illness, when they got a fever, when they got a cold. You fast them for two, three days, and they often got better. Um, unfortunately, uh, these um, very humane practices, it was far better than any of the leeches and lancets and the, the medicines they gave you to, to vomit and to have diarrhea and, you know, the blistering things that they put on you. It was, it was a far more humane medicine, but um, it lost out. And one of the reasons that fasting lost out was because um, <laughs> it seems it's almost a universal that when you call a doctor, whether in uh, you know, first century AD Rome or 21st century United States, what you want is action. You want someone who's going to say, I'm going to do this and you're going to, you're going to take this. You're going to get better because I've given you this intervention. They don't want, oh, well, your body is a self-healing machine. And in many cases, not all by any means, but in many cases, if you leave it alone and give it rest, uh, and take away, you know, one of its main jobs, which is digesting your food and processing your nutrients. If you give it a break from that, it'll take the opportunity of that break to unlock these repair mechanisms that might heal you. People don't want to hear that. <laughs> and of course, they didn't have the science to know that that was what was going on. So they were just being told, just stay at home in bed, drink water, don't eat. And uh, eventually that fell by the wayside. So to, to, to condense a long history... Um, it really wasn't until the return of the Age of Reason, the Enlightenment in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries that we start to see a real, uh, more sort of scientific interest in fasting. The real awakening came in the 19th century when fasting doctors um, uh, began applying fasting in a more methodical manner. And it's even, even at this point, it was vastly more humane. All those methods I just mentioned, the leeches, the blistering, the vomiting, the diary, that, that was still medicine until about the middle of the 19th century, almost everywhere in the world, certainly in the Western world. So fasting was still a much more humane option, uh, a much less dangerous option than the option that, you know, most uh, doctors were practicing. But it was ironically viewed that, that the fasting doctors weren't scientific. They were peddling this like sort of old housewives medicine or something. Uh, they, they were not, you know, they didn't have scientific theories to bolster why we should make people vomit and why we should give them diarrhea and all this stuff, even though the theories were nonsense. So, um, so it was, even though there was this awakening in the 19th century, fasting was still widely rejected. 
The 20th century, that awakening continued to grow. There was more and more evidence that um, fasting was uh, curative, that it could repair uh, uh, um, various uh, ailments that people had. Um, but the 20th century also saw the birth of real advances in Western medicine. And unfortunately, nothing could really match this, could, uh, how to put it? it, it didn't quite scratch the same psychological itch as, wow, we have unlocked the secrets of the atom, we've unlocked the secrets of the cell, we have found that, you know, you know these new techno solutions that are going to make you, uh, to make you healthier. Um, so, so even though in the early 20th century, it had been discovered that fasting could reverse type two diabetes, that fasting could often uh, reverse, sometimes completely eliminate childhood epilepsy. Fasting was no match for insulin, which was this new thing that was discovered that we could give diabetics and they'd be kind of okay. Never mind that fasting actually got rid of the diabetes in many cases, and you had to, if you were taking insulin, you were taking insulin for life. Um, never mind that with childhood epilepsy, you could get rid of epilepsy through fasting in some cases, whereas the alternative that came about were these, um, these anti-convulsant drugs that you also had to take for life that didn't get rid of epilepsy. They just, you know, tamped down your seizures, uh, often with some pretty yicky side effects. So, but, but it didn't matter. It didn't matter that fasting could do these things because doctors were just wrapped up with and enamored in these um, scientific solutions. And don't get me wrong, these were important advances. I'm glad we have insulin. I'm glad we have anti-convulsant drugs. Fasting doesn't work for everyone. But the doctors rejected even the possibility. I mean, you don't even, they don't even tell patients now who get diabetes or who bring in, you know, a parent brings in a child to uh, the doctor who's having seizures. They don't even tell them about the possibility that fasting can reverse these conditions. So, um, so where are we now with the state of medicine? Basically, the, almost about where we were 2,500 years ago, um, certainly where we were 100 to 200 years ago, which is the body, excuse me, the doctors have a very hard time accepting the news the body is a self-healing machine and it is making repairs all the time, but those repairs go through the roof when we take away the food and we give it the body a break from processing the food. Those repairs step up with fasting. It's just something that doctors are having a very, very hard time hearing even today. Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I'm an osteopathic physician and I chose to go to DO school because of that very principle. The body has the inherent capacity to heal itself. So I feel like that's always been part of my belief system that even through training, I always kept in the back of my mind. But then discovering plant based nutrition and now fasting, it's become even stronger. But what I was thinking about as you're talking about the history, I'm thinking about what's happening in our society and how the water that we're swimming in is getting even more difficult to accept and understand the role of fasting because we are flooded with food. Like there's food everywhere and we get the opposite message, right? So now people are afraid to even not eat for two hours because they're told it's going to slow down your metabolism and really bad things are going to happen to you. If you if you skip any meals, bad things will happen. Never do that. Your hormones are going to just go crazy, you know? And so I think we have like the opposite message, actually, that really the best thing for your body is just to constantly eat all the time. So it makes it even harder. And all the physicians in training, they were raised in that. And it's only getting worse and worse and worse. So I think it's just so counter to everything that we've been raised in and taught that a lot of physicians just simply cannot accept it. They're just, it, no, they're like, no, that would never, that's ludicrous. <laughs> Why would, who would think of doing that? So yeah. But thankfully, there are some people that now are are coming around to understanding the principles and even practicing it. I had Dr. Alan Goldhammer. I know that you talk about Dr. Okay. Alan Goldhammer in your book, so he's on the series as well. So let's talk about some of your favorite stories about fasting. And this would probably be a good time too, if you want to share your personal experience. So what happened in your life and how, you know, you rediscovered fasting for health benefits and maybe a couple of stories from the book that you really like. 
Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with one from the book, then I'll go to my myself. Um, so I, I think I'll tell you the story of America's first fasting doctor, at least the first one who we know of who practiced fasting with any... Um, any reach in his practice. So he was, uh, his name was Isaac Jennings, and he was a young doctor in rural Connecticut uh, in the early 19th century, so the early 1800s. He'd just gotten his degree from Yale. He goes out and practices in the conventional manner, which is prescribing all these medicines, which are just terrible, um, that he had been taught. Uh, in early America, um, the, the states were just swept by these fevers from time to time. Yellow fever, typhoid fever, malaria, typhus, um, and they were just devastating. Uh, I think uh, fever killed vastly more people during the Revolutionary War than British muskets ever killed, for example. So um, there was a fever sweeping through his, his district at one point, and he has a patient who, um, who he goes to diagnose and says, yeah, you've, you've got the fever. And he reaches for his saddlebags to get the medicine out to give to the patient. The patient, who he, he later writes about, he calls him Mr. P. Um, Mr. P says, uh, uh, actually, no, I don't need any medicine. Uh, I'll give you a call if I, you know, I won't give you a call, but I'll send someone to, uh, to fetch you if, if I do. And Jennings says, you've got a very serious fever. You absolutely need this medicine. He tries to get Mr. P to take it. Mr. P says, absolutely not. And Jennings rides away and says, well, I'll, I'll hear from him in three or four days um, when, when things have gone from bad to worse. A couple days later, he's out riding his district and he sees Mr. P out working, you know, I think it's chopping wood in this wooded lot. And he gets off his horse and he says, well, wh wh what happened? What did you do? And Mr. P says, well, I didn't do anything. I just went home. I rested. I, I stopped eating and I drank water. And after a couple of days, I felt better. And here I am. So this gets Jennings to thinking, and a few years later, he, there's another case of fever uh, sweeping his district, and there's a woman named Mrs. French who's having a terrible time with it. And he tries every medicine in the book on her. She throws them all up. She can't keep anything down. Mrs. French's uh, nurse, who's, who's taking care of her there, says the only thing that stays on her stomach uh, is cold water from the spring. Uh, and this gets uh, Jennings to thinking about Mr. P, and, and he decides to uh, conduct an experiment. So he goes to the spring, fills up a medicine vial with water, uh, caps it, brings it back to the nurse and says, give her this medicine. She can have only this medicine as mu and as much water as she cares to drink. Don't let her swallow any, anything else. No food, no nothing. He comes back later. Mrs. French is well on the way to being mended and healed. At this point, Jennings says, I'm going to throw out all the medicines I have, and anytime someone in my uh, district gets sick, I'm going to give them fake medicine. So he created these little, you know, the vials of just water that he tinted. He dyed in order to make them look more medicinal. He made these little bread pills, and he would sort of tint them as well to make them colored and look like medicine pills from the day. Um, and, and he did this for years. And his impression, obviously this is not a scientific study, his impression was that people got better faster, quicker, when he gave them these fake medicines and told them just drink water, do not eat, um, than they had before when they were eating and um, uh, you know taking the so-called medicines. So eventually, uh, Jennings, he's an honest guy, he decides he needs to tell the people in his, his district that this is what he's been doing, and he's, he's, he's so certain they're going to rise up against, against him, he, uh, he arranges with another doctor to take over his practice when his uh, patients run him out of town. Uh, but in fact, he tells them what's going on. They take it pretty well. He stays in town. Many of them continue fasting when they get sick, when they call him to ask for what they should do whenever they get sick. So um, it was a very humane, it was a very sound, it was a, a very, uh, you know, happy ending sort of story. Um, and yet the, the, the saddest part of the story is, is that when Jennings then later wrote about this, in, in effect saying, which was absolutely true, the medicine of the day is completely bogus. We would be better off if we just had people fast when they get sick. Um, and um, uh, when he wrote about this and, and, and said this, the response was just, he was completely ignored. It was, um, you know, it could have been an enormous advance in medicine. This thing happened, this sort of story, not exactly in these exact details, but something like this happened in one way or another multiple times 
throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And over and over again, the doctors were just pushed aside. Now, a word of caution here. I'm not saying that every single time someone gets acutely sick, if they fast, they will get better. We don't know that. We do know that it happens in some cases. And studies could have been made. They still could to find out which cases fasting would be helpful in and which cases fasting would be harmful in. Um, certainly at the time, fasting was much more helpful than anything else they had going. So that's a, a cautionary tale. Um, and then as for my own history, so, um, so I suffered throughout my 20s, 30s, and 40s in gradually worsening degree from a, a string of related um, psychiatric and neurological uh, illnesses. And the, um, the, the, the one that sort of kicked it all off when I was uh, younger was uh, garden variety depression. I mean, I say garden variety just because everyone knows about it. It wasn't garden variety, believe me. It was clinical depression, sometimes uh, taken to nearly suicidal you know, limits. Um, for a quarter century, uh, I was able to keep it at bay, more or less, with um, antidepressants like Prozac and so on, um, which constantly had to be refreshed because you eventually get what psych, uh, psych, uh, psychiatrists often call the Prozac poop out, where it just stops working eventually, um, perhaps because your body is habituated to it. So I, I kept having these cycles where I would, you know, just tumble into depression every few years and we'd have to, you know, fiddle with the drugs and so on. Over time, I developed a whole string of other uh, illnesses that went with this. I won't go into them all, but one of them that I, I will go into, the weirdest one, um, was called idiopathic hypersomnia. Hypersomnia just means you're exhausted all the time. You want to sleep all the time. Idiopathic means doctors and scientists have no idea what, what's behind it um, and no idea what to cure it with. The best they can do is give you some stimulants like Ritalin or things like that that just sort of pep you up in an amphetamine kind of way. Now, some people have this disease in a terrible way. They, they, the, the worst part of it is no matter how much you sleep, you do not wake refreshed. So some poor people can sleep 20 hours a day. They wake up, they're exhausted, stumbling around in those four hours the way the rest of us feel, like in those two minutes before you fall asleep at night where you can't keep your eyelids open. So luckily I had a you know somewhat mild case in the, uh, you know, it wasn't that severe. I only felt that way, let's say three or four hours a day, not like, you know, and I was awake 16 hours. So, but, but I had to, had to choose every single morning when I got up, do I want to take this awful stimulant, some drug like Ritalin, which to me made me totally hyped up. It made me irritable. It made me terrible to be around. Uh, it made, made it harder for me to sleep at night. Or do I want to gamble and think maybe I can try to get through the day <laughs> um, without this crutch? Uh, and if I can't, then I guess, uh, well, there's another day where I don't get any work done. There's another day where I'm too tired to help cook the dinner at night. I'm too tired to parent our child when he needs help with homework. I'm too tired for anything. It was just a long, slow, horrid decline. And little by little, I was losing my mental faculties because of it. I, I couldn't remember things. Um, I tell this story in the book. Uh, I was at one point driving near my wife's office toward the end of the workday, and I called her up on the phone to say, hey, honey, do you want to ride home? Before I remembered, she was in a conference in New Orleans where she had been for three days. <laughs> so you'd think I would have, my mind would have processed this. Anyway, I, I could see the writing on the wall. It was ugly where this was headed. And to make a, a long story short, what happened was um, I actually, uh, I fasted, not to try to cure any of these illnesses because I had long sort of bought into the dichotomy. People talk about fasting mostly to cure somatic illnesses, illnesses of the body, not psychiatric illnesses, illnesses of the mind. In fact, as I learned later and wrote about, there's a long history in, in Russia in particular of using fasting to cure psychiatric illnesses. But I fasted for a, a completely different reason, not to cure these illnesses. And a few days into my fast, my, uh, everything dropped away. My hypersomnia that had plagued me for 10 or 12 years dropped away. My other uh, mental and neurological illnesses over the course of this two-week fast dropped away one by one. And then I was faced with the, the question that um, 
that becomes obvious to all people who fast and get better. Well, if my illnesses went away when I took the food away, was there something in the food that maybe contributed or even outright caused my illnesses? And so I was terrified with, oh my God, well, what, when I break my fast, am I going to get all these illnesses back? So I went looking for, well, what do you do? What do you eat? And actually, you know, you mentioned Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who uh, runs the True North Health Center, America's largest and oldest fasting clinic. It's been open almost 40 years now in Northern California. Uh, I had interviewed him about 10 years before for an article I'd written about fasting. And I saw in my interview, my, I went back and looked at my notes, where he had said, look, we can make all these wonderful, we, we can make all kinds of diseases go away with fasting. I can get rid of your high blood pressure. I can get rid of your rheumatoid arthritis, maybe. I can get rid of this, that, or the other. But if you go back to eating what you ate before you fasted, odds are those diseases are just going to come back. So we put people here on a whole plant, SOS-free, a diet that's free of added salt, oil, and sugar, a minimally processed vegan diet. And I said, aha, I should have listened 10 years ago. I'm going to listen now. And that's uh, what I switched my diet to four years ago when I came off that fast. And sure enough, uh, you know, in my case, certainly, um, the diseases have stayed away. And I have no doubt in saying that the fast uh, was the trigger that that um, that spared me from those diseases, but it's the diet absolutely that has maintained the remissions. Yeah, Ugh, that's so fascinating. And I do have somebody on the series talking about using fasting for mental health and psychiatric conditions as well. And I think that that's also even within the fasting community and talking about fasting as a topic in general, that's still one that we have to take a, a little bit more of a leap for because we still have that separation, right? Where we're not considering the mind and the brain part of the rest of the body. So it's a little bit of a stretch even for people that are that are believers in it and what it can do. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, as far as where we are in understanding the science behind fasting and how much it's being practiced and recommended in the mainstream, where what trends are you seeing right now? Do you feel like it's picking up in some some communities and some circles in the medical community, or do you think that it's it's one of those things that's kind of staying the same? What do you think? Yeah, it's not really picking up in the medical community, I don't think. In the scientific community, it is. So the researchers, and some of those are, are doctor, PhD researchers who are, you know, both in the medical and the scientific community, but they're getting it mostly because they're in the scientific community. And the reason it's picking up there, and the reason it might someday filter down to doctors, who knows, is that um, the mechanisms are becoming clearer and clearer every year. We know that when we give our bodies a break from eating, and that your body takes, you know, as I've been saying, this opportunity to uh, unlock these repairs. Well, those are repairs. Those are, for instance, increases in repairs to our DNA. Vitally important because the DNA is the set of instructions for everything that goes on in our bodies. It's increasing autophagy, which is the recycling of old and worn out parts within our cells, which if not replaced... Uh, will um, turn into disease. Uh, it decreases body-wide inflammation. It increases the amount of antioxidants that protect us from free radicals. It increases insulin sensitivity. As all these mechanisms are becoming known, scientists can't look away. Scientists <laughs> tend, you know, for all their flaws a lot of the time, they will often follow the science and they're doing a pretty good job of doing that. Unfortunately, in translating this to doctors, um, it just hasn't penetrated. And that's even though we have more than 100 years of very credible reports from doctors, from patients, and now we even have some studies, some randomized controlled trials, showing that fasting can prevent and reverse uh, some aspects of cardiovascular disease, like high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes I've mentioned. It's extremely good at reversing autoimmune diseases, like rheumatoid arthritis, or ankylosing spondylitis, or ulcerative colitis. I could go down a whole list, asthma, allergies, fibromyalgia myalgia, and large prostate, prostate, what doctors seem unable to wrap their head around is that fasting works, um, it works so well and can work for such a broad range of illnesses because it's initiating these repairs at a very basic systemic level in cells in every part of the body. Medicine has gone into this sort of specialized mindset 
where it's not like you eat a bad diet and one person gets kidney disease and another person gets follicular lymphoma and another person gets cardiovascular disease. No, no, no. You get kidney disease because there's something wrong with your kidney. You get cardiovascular disease because there's something wrong with your arteries. They don't trace it all the way back to its very root cause of why did you get that? Because you ate a bad diet or maybe you didn't sleep well or you stressed too much or you didn't exercise, but chiefly it's diet. And so you have this very interesting phenomenon where you have these mainstream doctors who, who claim to be making their decisions on evidence-based uh, uh, science. Um, and yet the evidence has been mounting and mounting and mounting, and they just won't hear it. So it's, it's, it, it's got almost nothing to do with the evidence itself. The fact that there's growing science, that may help us penetrate the minds of doctors someday. But there's got to be, you know, you, you talked about this, this mind shift, this water we're swimming in of, well, everyone thinks you should just eat more. Um, there are some mind shifts like that that really have to occur that uh, are independent of the science or the evidence, I think. Yeah, agreed. Medicine moves super slow. <laughs> like changes in medicine move so slow. I mean, I've been practicing medicine out of training for 13 years now. And, you know, there's so many things I'm still doing the same. And sometimes I'm like, has there been an update to that? Are we still doing that? <laughs> you know, it's like, um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. I want to get into this before we wrap up, but you, you brought it up at the beginning and it's something that I am super interested in. And that is body image and how fasting has been used for weight loss and what your opinion is as far as um, the use of fasting for weight loss and how it might affect body image. Yeah, so I didn't fully appreciate um, how fasting and body image were sort of twisted together, mostly in a very unhealthy way, until I published the book. Um, I'm pretty distant from the mainstream culture, media, pop culture. I'm not on social media. I hardly watch any TV. I don't read the magazines or go to the websites that people you know, go to. But when you publish a book, your publisher very understandably wants you to go out and market it, which gets you involved with some of these media. And I had been writing this book about fasting for health. And what I found was in, the, in, in most of the media and social media, it's almost entirely about weight loss. And it's not about healthy weight loss. Now, there is a paradox here. We have mountains of evidence showing, all things being equal, if you're slender versus being overweight or obese, you're more physically healthy when you're slender. Um, but uh, browbeating people to get there, body shaming them to get there, isn't helping. And if you're destroying their psychological health, okay, great. Maybe you got them. Maybe you 99 times out of a hundred. No, maybe you got them to be slimmer, but you've destroyed their psyche. So what kind of life is that? What have you done? And as, as we have discussed that the burden that has fallen on women and girls is just, uh, enormous for this. So it's a real concern. Um, you can lose weight fasting. It's simple physics. <laughs> you burn a certain amount of calories a day. If you're not taking any calories in, you're gonna burn your fat. You will lose weight, no doubt about it. However, you're going to, in most cases, you're gonna put that weight back on, all right, if you don't change to a healthier diet. So it makes a lot more sense, and most fasting doctors who, who I have uh, trust and faith in what they're doing, try to get their patients to eat a healthier diet first. Now, it's often very hard. If you're used to uh, fatty, meaty, cheesy, salty, sugary foods, your taste buds have acclimated to all that. A carrot doesn't taste that good. You know, spinach tastes terrible. And fasting can help with that. Goldhammer talks a lot about this, uh, about this, um, you know, our dopamine receptors are trained by what we eat to love this unhealthy food. One benefit of a fast is it resets your taste buds, your taste buds neuroadapt on a fast. So all of a sudden after a fast, Brussels sprouts may taste great, whereas they tasted terrible two weeks ago. Okay, so fasting is a very useful tool, but I see it as that, as a tool to be used carefully and cautiously in conjunction with a healthy diet. Okay, I'll just add one other thing to this. I'm, when I've been speaking of fasting in this way, I'm speaking mostly of prolonged fasting. Fasting for five days, fasting for two weeks, fasting for three weeks, which most people should be doing under the care of a medical practitioner experienced in supervising fasts. Okay, 
There's another kind of fasting, and that's daily fasting, which a lot of people call intermittent fasting. And that's just restricting your um, the amount of time you eat each day. Anyone, virtually anyone can do that at home. If you're on medications or something, talk with your doctor to make sure the timing of your fast isn't going to you know, mess with your medications. But there are very good studies showing that you don't have to change a thing about what you're eating. Now, it's healthier if you do, if you eat a healthier diet. You can eat the exact same thing you're eating, the exact same number of calories you're eating. If you narrow your eating window each day to 12 hours or fewer, most people are eating across 14, 15 hours a day, to 12 hours, 10 hours, 8 hours, if you can narrow your eating window, you can gradually, slowly help this uh, weight loss process because people find when they just restrict the amount of time that they eat, um, they do actually usually take in fewer calories. And since most of us are eating a lot of unhealthy calories, particularly late at night, um, if you can narrow when you're, you know, get rid of the nighttime eating, um, people do often find that simply um, not changing a thing about what they eat, just when they eat, um, uh, end up losing a bit of weight. And so the daily fasting can be a useful tool. But again, uh, if it's all wrapped up in, you know, getting the bikini body that matches what's on the cover of the six magazines at the checkout counter, oh, that can be psychologically really troublesome. Yeah. And the thing that concerns me the most about it is because there's such a big emphasis on weight loss, people are not hearing the health message. And to me, that ability to use it as a tool for optimizing your health and well-being. I mean, it's just like so powerful. It's like gold and it's changed my life, you know? So I really, I really wish that people would stop emphasizing it for weight loss because just like you said, if nothing else changes, um, you know, people end up back where they were anyway. And I'm not talking about, I don't want to be talking about body size pros or cons here, but really if you look at it for as a tool for helping you feel better, for helping some of these health problems and don't ignore the whole weight thing, it could completely change your life because you're going to end up being more consistent with it too, you know, which brings me to the question of what is your regimen? Are you practicing daily time restricted eating? Do you throw in longer fast periodically? What's kind of your routine now? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, like everyone on this planet, fast every day. We all fast every day. That's one thing that I, you know, what uh, the, the, a lot of us just don't don't uh, recognize. So um, there are two big new findings that scientists have made that we probably don't have time to go into all of it. But but the gist is the first big finding, and this is just in the last you know five years or so. We are much healthier when we eat in a narrower window each day. 12 hours or fewer, all the way down to six hours. And the reason is it gives our body much more time to make repairs overnight. And we're not making enough repairs overnight, which we think is probably one of the reasons why we have so much chronic disease, in addition to, of course, our bad diet. That's the number one reason. Um, the second big finding is that uh, researchers, researchers have found that our circadian rhythms have just hardwired us to process nutrients best in the morning and the early afternoon. Frankly, we're pretty bad at it by late afternoon, early evening, by nighttime, we're just terrible at it. Um, and um, I discuss a lot of the studies, I have a whole chapter on this in my book explaining why that is. There appears to be nothing we can do to change that. We are just, it's just baked into us. Probably, this is a guess, but probably it's because there was no percentage, there was no advantage in eating late at night. Uh, you know, in equatorial Africa where we uh, evolved, um, you know, those who went out and ate at night were the ones who were at every disadvantage against the nocturnal predators out there. So really paid to eat during the day. What, what they've, you know, to, to, to condense a, an awful lot of science, what they have basically found is that the healthiest eating window appears to start about an hour or two after we wake up and runs for about six hours. So from about, let's say, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. for most people. All right. So that's what I try to do. I try to eat. I usually eat between about 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. most days. Now, I know that sounds crazy. And I know that people, you know, it sounded crazy to me. I was always a breakfast skipper. I loved eating late at night. I loved those long lingering meals, you know, well after dark. It was the most amazingly easy big change I've ever made in my life. I was shocked. But for 
for people who are freelance writers who work at home and can set their own schedule, or maybe you have kids you want to eat dinner with, there are a lot of reasons you want to eat dinner. There may be a compromise, all right? What scientists have found is if you can get most of your calories in that earlier window, so a bigger breakfast and a bigger lunch, then have dinner early if you can to keep it light. So that adage that was coined by this sort of quack dietitian, but she turned out to be right in the last century, <laughs> to eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper is actually really good advice. So, um, so uh, any eating window shorter than 12 hours appears to give health benefits over what we're doing now. So don't panic if you can't get all your eating in six hours. Just move as much of it as early as you can and, you know, don't eat well into the, into the nighttime and you can get some benefits. So anyway, that's what I do for my daily fasting. For prolonged fasting, uh, uh, fasting doctors like Alan Goldhammer and others uh, believe, they don't have hard science to back them. This is based on clinical observation. They believe that a prolonged fast once a year under supervision of a week or longer if you have symptoms, you have problems that need to be resolved uh, once a year uh, is good as sort of a house cleaning mechanism. And so because I had all these illnesses only a few years ago, I feel like I'm still in recovery. So rather than doing a once a year maintenance week long fast, I do a twice a year uh, week long fast for maintenance. And sometimes I go longer um, if I have something that's been bugging me or I've been in uh, a lot of stress. When I go longer, I do it under supervision at a fasting clinic because I don't think you should go longer than a week on your own at home, even if you're as healthy as can be. Great. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Goldhammer has already offered to lock me up at True North. So <laughs> <laughs> when I get enough time, eventually I do want to try it and see how, how you know what the experience is there. Well, Steve, this has been fantastic. Before I get to the final rapid fire questions, please tell us where we can connect with you and where we can get your book. Yes, yeah, so my book's available anywhere books are sold. Uh, love your independent local bookstore if you've got one. If not, there's a great outfit called bookshop.org. Works a lot like Amazon. It's put together by a consortium of independent booksellers. You just go there, buy the book, they send it to your door, but the profits... Don't go to Jeff Bezos, who's doing just fine, I think. They go instead to your nearest local independent bookstore. So it's bookshop.org. They're great. Uh, to con uh, uh, connect with me, uh, my website's the best place. It's just my name, stevehendricks.org. There is a frequently asked questions page that has, I don't know, 10,000 or so words of answers to the most common questions I get about fasting. If one of your uh, questions is not answered there, go to the contact page and shoot me an email. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's so generous of you. Okay. You ready for the final rapid fire questions? Absolutely. Okay. What is your favorite thing about fasting? That it reverses and sometimes eliminates diseases that doctors say that there's no cure for, but in fact there is. Yeah. High blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and much more. I love it. What's your biggest fasting pet peeve, such as a myth, misconception, or a misuse? Yeah, all these bogus quotations have arisen around fasting that fasting writers today just love to quote without checking. So Plato supposedly said, I fast for greater physical and mental efficiency. Or Hippocrates supposedly said, to eat when you are sick is to feed your sickness. Or let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food and on and on and on. They're not true. Check the sources. <laughs> those writers never wrote those. Please stop saying them. <laughs> Okay, I guess I'm I will be guilty of that one too then because definitely the let medicine or the let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food was is one that I have misquoted then. So, thank and, you and for I, setting and, us and straight. I, I speak as a guilty person having <laughs> used some of those myself, so I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> okay, final question. What's one thing you want people to understand about fasting? Yep, you're already doing it. You're already fasting every single night. If you do it smarter by fasting a little longer and stacking your eating earlier in the day, we think you'll have less disease and live a longer life. I love it. Steve, it was such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for writing this book and for all of the work and the passion that you've poured into it. And thank you for everything that you do. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, veggie lover, I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? 
please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.